We know that all organisms are made of cells, and we know that complex multicellular organisms, such as ourselves, are made of many different kinds of cells. But what do I really mean when I say different kinds of cells? What makes cells different? If you look at different types of cells under a microscope, for example, say you take cells from your liver, cells from a muscle, cells from your brain, they all look different, or they can look different. Indeed, differences in the way cells function often relate to differences in the way cells are shaped. Muscle cells are elongated, for example. Uh, brain cells often have long extensions protruding from them that serves a, serve as a kind of cellular wire. We'll look at that later in the course. And so forth. Different cells are different shapes. They look different ways. But the really critical differences between different kinds of cells found in an organism have more to do with molecules than morphology. Specifically, different kinds of cells differ fundamentally because they contain different kinds of proteins. That is, different kinds of enzymes, different kinds of protein receptors, structural proteins, and so forth. This observation leads us to an interesting puzzle. Tens of thousands of different proteins may be coded for by the genome of a eukaryotic cell. But only a fraction of these proteins will be found in any particular cell at any particular time, with different kinds of cells having different sets of the possible proteins that these cells could produce. A typical cell, for example, might only um, express, say, less than 5% of all of the proteins it's capable of making at any one time. This presents a puzzle because multicellular organisms all start out as a single cell and we assume that they must have the same genes. How can different cells containing different sets of how can different set kinds of cells containing different sets of proteins exist if they all start out with the same genes because the genes are what give us the proteins. Now, we have the same puzzle, even if we're talking about a single-celled organism, such as a bacteria. Just as different kinds of cells in a multicellular organism don't need to have all the same kinds of proteins, a single cell or a single-celled organism may need to have different proteins at different times, depending on what it's doing at that particular time. Now, you might ask, why doesn't the cell just make all the proteins it can and, can and keep them on hand, storing them, for example, until it needs them. It would be as though a store um, that sold many products kept all of those products stocked on its shelf, even though some of those products weren't sold very often. The reason not to do this is because simply making proteins is expensive. It costs something to make proteins, and if the cell doesn't need the protein, why make it? And furthermore, proteins don't actually all have a very good shelf life, so you can't store them very well sometimes. So it makes sense that a cell should only produce the proteins it needs at the particular time or for a particular function on an on-demand basis. This brings us back to our question. How does a cell control the production of proteins so that of all the possible proteins it's capable of making, given its genetic endowment, it only produces an appropriate subset of them? Now, we know that for a cell to make a protein, it has to transcribe the DNA that codes for that protein into messenger RNA, and then translate that messenger RNA into a polypeptide. So we can rephrase our question to ask, why aren't all the genes that a cell possesses being transcribed and translated all the time? The general answer to this question which may be obvious to you at this point, is that cells regulate gene expression by controlling the conditions necessary for transcription and translation to occur. How cells do this is going to be the subject of this next lecture and the next. Well, let's start by asking briefly how, in theory at least, you might imagine um, protein production could be regulated in the cell. The central dogma of molecular biology, which we discussed earlier in the course, provides a framework for beginning to answer this question. Remember to convert um, information about protein structure that's latent in a molecule of DNA. We first have to transcribe that DNA and then translate the RNA that's produced into a protein.
In eukaryotic cells, we also saw that there were some additional steps here. The original transcription of the RNA often needs to be further processed because remember, eukaryotic genes have introns in them that have to be removed from the exons and then the exons are stitched back together. Furthermore, as we'll see later, Sometimes the final polypeptide, that's the string of amino acids uh, that make up a protein, the final polypeptide that's produced by translation needs to be polished off and modified in a few ways before it becomes a fully functional protein. Each molecular step in this complex pathway, from transcription on down the line, provides a potential point where we could control the production of proteins if we could control the activity of the cell at that point. But even though all of these steps can <clears throat> and do in some cases get used to control gene expression, the majority of gene expression that occurs in a cell, the majority of gene regulation occurs at the level of the initial transcription of DNA into RNA. <clears throat> That's to say, the most ubiquitous way in which cells control which genes they express is to control the synthesis of mRNA in the first place. Why should this be the case? Well, again, it has to do with cost. Every step in this synthetic pathway costs something in terms of energy and the resources needed to build new molecules. Why let that progression go too far instead of just cutting it off right at the beginning? It's the most cost-effective way and indeed, this is the way cells regulate protein production. So, the most important question that we have to begin to address now is this. What determines whether a particular gene on a DNA molecule is transcribed or not? And that's the essential question that we want to answer when we're talking about gene expression. The most simple way to state the answer to this question is that each gene has a kind of switch associated with it, a switch that actually is part of the DNA molecule itself. To a first approximation, this switching mechanism can be viewed as kind of a lock and key, like the switch that you might use to turn on a car. Now, the lock of this mechanism is part of the DNA itself in general. Usually, it's a specific sequence of nucleotide bases that has a distinct uh, that is distinct from, but immediately adjacent to, that sequence of nucleotide bases that will actually code for the protein. We call the part of the gene that actually contains the code for the protein the coding region. No surprise there. Each gene also has associated with it, then, what we would call regulatory regions. Regulatory regions that are generally upstream from the coding region before the DNA polymerase that would transcribe the gene would get started. It has to start at this upstream point. And it's these regulatory regions which sort of represent the lock that we have to unlock uh, in order for the gene to be transcribed. Now, if there's a region of DNA that serves as the lock, what's the key? Well, the general answer to that question is that the key is usually a kind of protein. A protein with the right shape to fit the DNA lock. Now remember, DNA is made of a sequence of nucleotide bases. Unique sequences of bases will characterize different parts of the DNA. So what we need is a protein that has the right shape, which includes the particular um, physical and chemical characteristics of the amino acids on the outside of that shape, that can interact with a particular sequence of bases on the DNA. Now it's important to keep in mind here that the interaction between the protein key and the DNA lock is highly specific often, meaning that only a certain protein will fit a certain part of the DNA. Just as often is the case for your car, actually hopefully always is the case for your car, only a particular key will, for, will fit a particular car's lock. Now, so, in general terms, we have a kind of genetic lock and key mechanism, and I'm going to develop the details of that mechanism over the course of the next couple of lectures. But how do the lock and key actually control whether or not a particular gene gets transcribed? Well, remember that RNA polymerase has to bind to the DNA in order for transcription to occur. We looked at that process in some detail earlier on. But RNA polymerase is not 
able to just land anywhere on a stretch of DNA. Instead, it must land in a particular part of the DNA that we call a promoter. This is, again, another specific stretch of bases that are occurring upstream of the coding region of the gene on a molecule of DNA. Now, the interesting thing about RNA polymerase being able to bind to this promoter is that sometimes it can't do it on its own, and so it needs help. And the help that it gets are often, is often coming from the proteins that are interacting with regulatory regions just adjacent to the promoter. Okay, so let's actually now look in a little more detail at how a regulatory pro uh, uh, protein can interact with a regulatory region on DNA and in so doing turn on or off the uh, transcription of a particular section of that DNA. Well, actually, there are a couple of general ways that this can occur, and really two very different ways. One which is very characteristic of the way prokaryotic cells work. Those are bacteria, mostly, you'll recall. And the other, more characteristic of the way that eukaryotic cells work. Now, there is often in prokaryotic cells a particular kind of regulatory region that is occurring between the promoter the place where the RNA polymerase will land on the DNA in between that promoter and the gene to be transcribed. This regulatory region is a place where a protein will come in and sit. And in this case, if the protein is on the DNA, it physically blocks the RNA polymerase from being able to move down the DNA molecule and go on and transcribe the gene of interest. The protein, the regulatory protein, is physically blocking its path. This kind of regulation we call negative control because it's the presence of the regulatory protein, that is, the presence of the key in the lock, that actually turns off the transcription of the gene, as opposed to turning it on. Negative control. And this is actually sort of the reverse situation to the analogy with your car. It would be as though you'd have to take the key out of the lock of the car to make the car go, as opposed to putting the key into the lock of the car. Now, the other general mechanism by which regulatory regions and regulatory proteins, that is, locks and keys, can control the activity of RNA polymerase has to do with the fact that RNA polymerase, as I said, is not always able to efficiently bind to the promoter itself. And as I said before, in this case, regulatory regions, either part of the promoter, as part of the promoter, or just adjacent to the promoter, or as we'll see later, quite far some distance from the promoter. These regulatory regions where regulatory proteins bind are the binding of proteins to these regulatory regions is necessary for the RNA polymerase to be able to even find and efficiently begin to bind to the DNA and thus begin its work. If these regulatory proteins in this case are necessary to be present in order for transcription to occur, we call this positive control. Actually, as we'll see later on, regulatory bo proteins binding to regulatory regions that influence the ability of RNA polymerase to bind in the first place can actually also have a negative effect. Some proteins will make it harder for the RNA polymerase to bind. Some will make it easier. So we can have both positive and negative control. So we really have a couple of contrasts that we want to keep in mind here. The first contrast is between a mechanism in which a regulatory protein physically blocks the passage of RNA polymerase by getting in its way, because the regulatory region is located between the promoter and the coding region of the gene, and if the protein is in place, the regulatory protein is in place, RNA polymerase can't move down the line. This contrasts with the alternative where regulatory proteins are affecting the ability of RNA polymerase to bind to the DNA in the first place. And then the second contrast, as I've said, is between negative control, in which the protein being present turns off transcription in one way or the other, and positive control, in which the regulatory protein turns transcription on. These are a lot of options to keep track of, I realize. So let's go back to our analogy um, between cars and the locks and keys in your car 
and the way that regulatory uh, proteins and regulatory regions of DNA work. If controlling gene expression is like turning on a car, then what these two systems have in common is first the fact that the car isn't always turned on, just as particular genes aren't always expressed. So that's a simple thing we've got in common. And second, we have in common the fact that there has to be some interaction between some kind of key and some kind of lock for the car to run. Now, the difference here is there are several differences that we want to highlight. The first important difference is that the driver, which is you if you're getting into your car, or RNA polymerase, if we're talking about gene expression, behaves very differently. When you want to get into your car, you say, that's my car, that's where I'm going. You recognize the car, and that's the car you get into. You have the key, and you drive off. RNA polymerase itself is not so selective. RNA polymerase will try any gene it can. It will always be just trying to, bi to bind to promoters. In other words, RNA polymerase and its interaction with the promoter region is not at all selective. So this is different than the way we think about cars and drivers and keys. Now, the second difference that we've talked about is that in some cases, a gene will only be expressed if a particular key is not in the regulatory lock. And as I said, this is quite different from the way we think about cars. This would be as though we have to take the key out of the lock of the car to make the car run. Now, a third difference, one we haven't mentioned yet, but one which is especially important when we begin to talk about gene regulation in eukaryotic cells, is that there sometimes may need to be the, combi the right combination of many, many different kinds of keys for a gene to be expressed. That is, some genes have several different regulatory regions, and the gene will only be expressed if the right combination of regulatory proteins is present. This would be as though you needed a whole bunch of different keys to start one car. And furthermore, some of those keys have to be in the lock, and some of them have to be out of their respective lock. So the keys and locks we use with DNA, or that DNA um, uses to express different genes, are roughly analogous, but quite a bit more complex than the way we usually think about keys and locks. Now, I want to go and look at really what was the first and most simple case of um, our understanding of how gene expression works. An example that came from gene expression in a bacteria called Escherichia coli, or Escherichia coli, E. coli for short. Usually we biologists just shorten this to E. coli because we don't want to say Escherichia all the time. And E. coli, as you may know, is a very common bacteria and is commonly found in our own intestine. E. coli in our guts make their living by digesting various nutrients that are available to them from what we eat. And the nutrients that they have available obviously differ depending on what we're eating. And this then brings forward the question of how do these bacteria express different genes, if they do, in order to deal with the various kinds of nutrients that they're trying to digest. Now, in general, E. coli is capable of digesting a whole bunch of different nutrients. It especially prefers simple sugars like glucose, but it's also able to um, digest more complex molecules. And the one we're going to talk about is a slightly more complex kind of sugar called lactose. Lactose is so named because it's a complex sugar commonly found in milk. Now, the thing about lactose is that the way E. coli has to digest lactose is to first break it down into simpler sugars. Actually, it breaks it down into two simple sugar molecules, one of glucose and one of a sugar called um, uh, galactose. In order to do so, E. coli needs to be able to express a few enzymes that are used for the breaking down, or what I'll say, I'll call the metabolism of lactose, that they use for nothing else. And let me name these enzymes. They're somewhat big names, but I'm going to be referring to them as I go along, so we might as well get them out on the table. The first of these enzymes is called beta-galactosidase. Now, this is the enzyme that breaks lactose down in one molecule uh, from one molecule to two simpler molecules, one of glucose and one of um, uh, galactose. The other enzyme worth mentioning here is called galactoside permease. 
This enzyme actually doesn't break down lactose, but is necessary for the lactose to be brought from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. In other words, this enzyme, galactoside permease, is kind of helping to transport the lactose into the cell so it can be processed. There are a couple of other enzymes involved in the metabolism of lactose that I won't mention here because these two are really sufficient to understand the story. Biochemists in the early part of the 20th century um, that were interested in metabolism of bacteria and specifically of E. coli discovered early on that the um, enzymes used by E. coli to process lactose would only be made by those E. coli if lactose itself was present. In other words, the E. coli in my gut right now are not producing these enzymes because I haven't eaten any milk or milk products for quite some time. But if I drank a glass of milk right now, within a matter of minutes, the E. coli in my guts would start producing both beta-galactosidase and galactoside permease. You can look at this in culture and show that it's the lactose itself that somehow turns on, or as we say, induces the expression of these genes. And this is the observation that led two French biologists, Jacques Monod and Francois Jacob, to, be, to ask, beginning in the 1950s, how lactose could possibly act as what they called an inducer that regulates gene expression of these lactose metabolizing enzymes. Now, how did they go about doing this? Well, uh, Jacob and Monod actually used what is a very common approach to understanding uh, the structure and function of proteins and the genes that control them. They performed what they call what we call a mutant screen. They took E. coli and exposed them to a number of mutinizing agents, things like UV light or chemicals that induce mutations in the DNA, because they were trying to create mutant phenotypes specifically that somehow lacked some aspect of function function related to the ability to metabolize lactose. The idea here is that if you create a mutant that isn't able to do a particular thing, then that mutation must somehow have affected the gene that is responsible for producing the protein that causes that thing to happen. In the case of Jacob and Monod, what they were trying to do is find mutants that weren't able to produce, for example, beta-galactosidase or galactoside permease. And indeed, they found a number of kinds of mutants. Now, two of the mutants that they found actually were quite straightforward. They found one kind of mutation that obviously was a mutation in the gene for beta-galactosidase itself, because they were able to show, using biochemical techniques available at that time, that these mutants were simply unable to produce that enzyme. And they could conclude, therefore, that this must be a mutation in the part of the gene that coded for the protein itself. Um, just as an aside, they called this uh, the LAC-Z mutant, and I might use that term. It's a mutation for beta-galactosidase, the gene for beta-galactosidase. They called that gene the LAC-Z gene because when they first identified it, they weren't 100% sure that they knew exactly what it was. And so cautiously, they gave it a generic name, which is stuck. They found another kind of mutation that appeared to cause the bacteria to be incapable of transporting uh, lactose from the outside to the inside of the cell. And this was a mutation that directly affected the protein galactoside permease. And they called this gene the LAC-Y gene, and so this would be the LAC-Y mutant, a mutant that they could demonstrate could produce beta-galactosidase but it couldn't process lactose because it couldn't get the lactose inside of the cell. So clearly, the galactoside permease was missing. Now, these two kinds of mutations conform to the way that we've thought about mutations up to this point. A mutation occurring in some region of, the of, the, of uh, an organism's DNA that codes for a particular protein is almost invariably going to knock out the function of that protein. Why? Because most mutations are going to change the protein in some way that makes it not able to do its job because it's probably a different shape because it has a different amino acid in it. So both of these mutations were what we might call loss of function mutations. And they're the way we think mutation should occur. The, the, the bacteria can't do something because it doesn't have the protein.
But Jacob and Monod found a very different kind of mutation as well, a third class of mutation. These mutants were different because they always produced beta-galactosidase and galactoside permease. They never were able to turn these genes off. It didn't matter whether lactose was present or not. These genes would always be turned on. Now, this was puzzling because it's a, a mutation that's working a little bit differently. Somehow this mutation doesn't cause a loss of function. It sort of causes a gain of constant function. Well, Jacob and Minot named this gene the LAC-I gene. They called it the LAC-I gene because um, this uh, mutant um, didn't need the inducer, there's where the I comes uh, from, in order to turn on the production of these enzymes. So this third mutant presented a puzzle because it was a gain of function. Somehow, a protein being affected by this mutation caused the system to never be shut off. This observation led to a key insight by Jacob and Monod. And the insight was that somehow the protein coded for by the LAC-I gene must be involved in the regulation of the two other genes, the beta-galactosidase and the galactoside permease gene. Now, today this seems like a pretty simple idea, but at the time it was absolutely revolutionary. And the reason it was revolutionary is up to this time, biologists had thought of genes as simply coding for functional proteins, proteins like enzymes or, or receptors or structural proteins. But what Jacob and Monod were proposing was that there were particular kinds of proteins whose sole function it was to regulate the activity of other genes. Genes for regulatory proteins. Now, evidence that the LAC-I gene uh, or I should say the LAC-I gene's protein product was involved in the regulation of the LAC-Z and the LAC-Y genes seemed pretty clear to Jacob and Minot. This was a pretty obvious hypothesis once they had gained this insight to propose. The real question at the time was to figure out how this protein worked. That is, how could one protein influence the expression of genes for other proteins? Of course, Jacob and Minot realized that this was the critical question to answer to solve how, the problem of how genes can be expressed in general, in different types of cells or at different times in the same cell. Now, in this particular case, lactose metabolism, there was another part of the puzzle that was still pretty puzzling, and that is, how does lactose itself fit in the picture? Remember, in a normal cell, lactose appears to be what turns on gene expression. If you add lactose to a culture of E. coli, they start making beta-galactosidase and galactoside permease. So lactose is acting as an inducer, but Jacob and Minot had identified a protein that seemed to be involved in turning off the gene. Jacob and Minot called their protein a repressor because it repressed the expression of the other genes. So somehow, Lactose, an inducer, had to interact with the LAC-I gene product, the repressor, in such a way that the combination would either turn on or off the expression of other genes. Actually, Jacob and Minot puzzled over this for quite some time. And all the history books write this story in different ways. It seems clear that the insight they eventually gained was not one that they came on by themselves, but was one which was suggested to them by yet another researcher, a man named Leo Zillard, who was a physicist. Zillard is actually best remembered today for his work in nuclear physics and on the Manhattan Project back in the 1940s, and also for his very strong opposition to the initial deployment of atomic weapons. Zillar had worked theoretically on the problem of the biochemical pathways that, that organisms like bacteria use in metabolism. And so he was familiar with Jacob and Minode's work. And he proposed to them the following hypothesis, which we call the negative control a negative, the negative control model. He suggested that the way the system works is that lac-I, the lac-I protein, the repressor,
is always present in the cell because the LAC I gene is always turned on. When the repressor is present, somehow that repressor turns off the expression of the other genes. But lactose, Szilard suggested, must interact directly with the repressor and make the repressor itself non-functional. This, this interaction between lactose as an inducer turning off the repressor was how Szilard proposed that this system worked. The question then was how to test that model, and that's what we're going to turn to in the next lecture.